Hello and welcome. This is Clint Berry with Superior Livestock Auction, and I'm joined today with Davey Jones from Ag Defense Risk Management. Davey, you want to tell us a little bit about what your company does for uh, producers out in the field? I'll be glad to. Uh, Ag Defense is a risk management or a insurance agency. We're based out of Elgin, Oklahoma. Uh, we encompass about 22 states. Uh, in the in the area that we make our products and our services available to. Uh, we have a full line of insurance services, but we're primarily focused in the arena of crop insurance. So we try to help our producers uh, manage those risks that the federal crop insurance uh, policies help them address and do that in the most efficient way. We've uh, historically been very heavy in the uh, lines of federal crop insurance that apply to cattle mm -hmm. producers. And so the rainfall and the livestock products are our main emphasis. Absolutely. Um, and, and so a lot of producers are gonna be familiar with the, the you know terms like LRP or livestock protection. Um, but one of the services that your company's offering is livestock gross margin or what we call LGM. Can you tell us a little bit about that product and maybe a little bit about the history of that and where you know where that comes from because that's one product that most producers have not heard of in the in in prior years sure sure i'd be glad to do that matter of fact it is the relationship with the livestock risk protection that kind of led us to investigate the the livestock gross margin uh, if you if you're familiar with the livestock risk protection uh, it uh, after changes were made to it in 2020 uh, it became kind of the, the the front runner in terms of risk management for price, uh, both in feeder cattle and in fed cattle. Uh, it has uh, grown in its popularity tr popularity tremendously. Uh, but as you look at how well it competes with alternate ways of managing risk, it's much more competitive for the feeder cattle, the lighter calves. Uh, not so much. Uh, that it's not applicable to fed cattle, but the price advantageous uh, aspect of it is not nearly as attractive on fed cattle. And so we, we basically uh, kind of investigated the reason why that was true. And uh, after calling quite a few people through the crop insurance world uh, and at the USDA and at some of the universities where these products were developed, uh, really never got a firm answer. And uh, our, our end uh, thought on that was that when livestock risk protection was introduced in 2007, uh, livestock gross margin was introduced right alongside it. And right. the only thing that really seems to make sense when you look at the price uh, discrepancies between feeder and fed cattle on LRP is that the framers of those programs uh, were, were convinced that the livestock gross margin would be a better risk management tool for managing fed cattle risk than LRP fed cattle would be, and that they priced the LRP in such a way to cause people to more closely examine and consider livestock gross margin. There was no subsidies to livestock gross margin initially, and so even though that seems to be the attempt, it really didn't pan out that way. Uh, livestock gross margin has virtually zero following in the country. Uh, compared to LRP, which has grown in popularity from around a half a million head prior to the changes in 2020 to currently around six million head insured uh, following those changes. The livestock gross margin had similar improvements made in 2020, but the lack of an audience uh, produced a lack of response to those changes. And so our goal uh, through what we're doing here today is try to bring not just the changes to light, that, that has been fairly well communicated, but how those changes can be applied to better manage risk to fed cattle, uh, whether you're a feed yard owner or partner, or whether you're an individual producer feeding your own cattle. So Davey, as we, as we start talking about uh, livestock gross margin, you know, as with anything, there's terminology discussions that, that for a better understanding of what goes on. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Let's put some of that in perspective so that we can delve into what this product can offer for producers. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think we can do that. And and the way we'll try to address this is we'll talk kind of about the mechanics of the program in this first session. Uh, and then we'll talk about two specific applications in the two sessions that follow. So we're, we'll kind of go through the nuts and bolts and, and yes, I think some uh, terms that are going to be being used would be good to kind of point out as we get started. So the livestock gross margin 
uh, if you were going to define it, it would be uh, it would be to where a product that ensures the future actual results of feeding cattle compared to what the expected results were in the okay. beginning. And so we'll flesh that out a little as we go through it, sure. but that's what the livestock gross margin program is designed to do. Uh, within that framework, there's uh, terms like target marketing month, which would refer to the month that the fed cattle are expected to leave the feed yard. Great. And so as we go through this, that, that terminology will come up time and time again. The expected gross margin would be, for example, if you were buying uh, livestock gross margin insurance today, it's going to calculate what you expect the gross margin, the difference in feeder cattle and corn compared to fed cattle at some point in the future is going to be. Okay. And so the expected gross margin is where it all begins. When, it, when the coverage ends, when those cattle leave the feed yard, then an actual gross margin is calculated. So an actual gross margin would be the final calculated value of one fed animal less the inputs. Right. Feeder calf and corn. Okay. Uh, and then the gross margin guarantee would be the difference in the two, the difference in the expected and the actual. So we'll talk about gross margin guarantee a few times as we make our way through this. And a gross margin loss would be that event that would occur if the actual gross margin, what actually happens in the feed yard, mm -hmm. ends up being less than what the expected gross margin was. So then you would have what's termed a gross margin loss. Uh, the sales period uh, is a weekly option that you have to buy coverage. So every Thursday, when markets close around three to four o'clock in the afternoon, the USDA puts out the coverage pre premium and the gross margin expected values. Uh, and you have until 9 a.m. the following morning, 9 a.m. Friday morning, to exercise the option to buy. So the sales period would be that period from Thursday afternoon to Friday morning, okay. and that happens once a week. Uh, the covered period is the 11 months that follow the sales period. So you can cover cattle up to 11 months out okay. uh, with one stipulation. You can't co cover any cattle in the first month of that 11 month period. So you can ensure 10 months of production okay. should you choose to. Uh, so that, that's the covered period. Pooled coverage is, is it would be a scenario where you would ensure more than one month's target marketings at a time. So if you wanted to do all 10 months in one, one sales period, then you would have 10 month pooled coverage. You can go down as, as, as low as one or as many as 10 months in a pool. So that becomes real critical when we, especially when we get to the flexible features of LGM. Okay. And then finally, uh, there, there's, a, there's a deductible option. You can choose to have zero deductible. You can choose to have up to $150 per head deductible. And honestly, when I, when I read about the deductibles as I first began to investigate this, I thought it would probably be one of the least attractive features. But when we get through with these three sessions, I think uh, you'll probably agree it's one of the more uh, interesting options and one of the more interesting points of flexibility in the whole program. So those, those terms uh, will be th helpful as we kind of move on through this process. Uh, I think that, that it's good to kind of divide the program up uh, in asking uh, kind of why it works and how it works. And so first I'd like to maybe uh, just throw some things out about, about why it works. Uh, some of these make it unique to LGM, uh, some of these some of these are are not unique to LGM, but they may be unique to crop insurance in general. So so the why it works question uh, kind of start off by pointing out that that what LGM does is it provides an, an adjustable mirror to how people typically use futures contracts when protecting fed cattle risk. Uh, so it's it's not actually buying futures contracts but it's using numbers in a calculated formula that are based on futures contracts. And so, you know, what it does is it, it does the same thing that people do when they buy options or when they buy futures contracts. It just does it with mathematical calculations instead of 
actual contracts. So I, I think that becomes paramount in some areas when we look at how we would want to apply this. Uh, it also offers a, an extreme amount of flexibility in other ways. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some very concrete things that depending on how you use the concrete features, you create flexibility. So uh, it, it is relatively important when you look into this to talk with someone who understands not just that it's there, that it's available, that LGM is a federal crop insurance program, but understands the nuts and bolts about what makes it work and how you can tailor it to meet your specific needs uh, regardless of where you're involved at in the fed cattle process. Uh, but probably the, the, the most significant thing, and this is part of some of the changes that happened with LGM in 2020, at the same time that LRP had changes that caused it to you know, soar in popularity. Uh, prior to these changes, LGM had a, a very low head limit annually. So if you were feeding very many cattle, uh, you, you really ran out of the protection pretty early on. Uh, there's currently no head limit. Uh, so the 2020 changes eliminated the head limit. It also uh, changed the premium structure from being paid on the front end to the back end of coverage. So you don't have your capital, your operating capital tied up while you're feeding the cattle. Uh, and then it also went from a zero subsidy to an 18 to 50% subsidy based on the deductible that you choose. So I think you can see some of the flexibility features beginning to kind of come out. Uh, something that I think people who are heavily involved in crop insurance realize, but you know, what I find is a lot of cattlemen have never really participated in any right. form of crop insurance. And so they don't really understand the relationship between subsidies and return on investment. And so uh, what, what, what is the main thing that makes livestock gross margin work uh, and work well is the same thing that makes all federal crop insurance work well. It's the amount of subsidy. And so we built a chart that shows the relationship of percent subsidy to return on investment. And so just as kind of an introduction uh, to the concept and to kind of keep us thinking openly about this deductible, what we found is that at a zero dollar per head deductible, uh, under a particular scenario, and we applied this to several different scenarios, but in some of the least advantageous scenarios, at a zero deductible, we had about a five to seven percent return on investment, which in today's environment is not terrible. But at a $70 deductible, we saw about a 17 and a half percent return on investment. Uh, and this is in the least desirable end result in terms of how you structure coverage. So, so that's kind of a starting place. And when you look long term at return on money invested, 17.5% uh, sure fares pretty well compared to 5%. That's right. That's a big <laughs> difference. And nice to know that there is some flexibility built within that program for producers to tailor it to their needs. Uh, they just need to be confident in that they're working with their trusted provider to understand how all that applies and what best fits their scenarios. Correct. Correct. It's it's no different than anything else. It's kind of like a fingerprint. You know how LGM will work best in your feeding operation uh, is going to look different than a neighbor. And so not only is it important to consult with someone who kind of has a pretty good handle on this program, uh, it needs to be a one on one. I mean, obviously, we'd like to take this time and make a video and just just answer everyone's questions about their own operation. That just that's just not that's, that's just, just it's unrealistic, do, right. right? So so I think the, the the goal of these videos is going to be to give you enough information as a producer uh, to say this is something I should look more closely at or not. And so if we can accomplish that before we get done with these three sessions, uh, then we think we think that we'll we'll have done what we what we set out to do, which was to kind of bring this product out of the shadows, kind of into the light so people right. could see uh, whether uh, it's something that they need to look more closely at. So as we, as we look at those concrete features of livestock gross margin, there's basically four pillars that it's built upon. And through our conversation about the kind of the terms that are used, we've, we've covered a little, the, little bit of this, but I think it's good to kind of reinforce that, that these things in and of themselves cannot be changed. Right but they can be used uh, 
in an interrelated way to create a lot of flexibility. So, so let's talk about the, the, the concrete features. Uh, livestock margin has these four things that, uh, that we need to really keep in mind and, and understand in a pretty thorough way to do a good job of structuring the coverage that a, that a producer would want to have. First of all would be those expected versus the actual gross margin. That's, that's not something that we can uh, that we can redo, you know, if I was going to redo some of those, I, I would probably would, but I don't have that option. So those are fixed. There's a calculated formulas that are used to establish the expected and the actual gross margins, and we'll look at those in just a second. And the only changes for a producer to choose in that scenario would be what week they purchase the coverage in. Right, right. Yeah, your, your coverage option is up to you, uh, but how the calculations are carried out that's not up to us. We, we don't get to change those. Uh, then there's two types of coverage. One for calf fed. So those would be calves brought to the feed yard, you know, 550 to 600 pounds. Then there's yearling fed, which would be 750 pounds or, or greater. So there's, a, the, there's two types. And the values that are used in those calculations are different because you're, you've got two different types of livestock. So a producer gets to that point in the decision-making process and, and they need to understand how that best applies to their operation, whether they're planning on feeding calf feds or, or I should just say protecting, how's that? Because they may not even be purchasing that as a feeder, but calf feds or yearlings, and that is predominantly de depicted in upon what that weight scenario is. Cause right. You know, some producers have calves bigger than others, some have lighter, and, but the important thing there is to understand that there's, that those, those programs can be tailored to how it best fits your scenario, although there is a structure to what those formulas are. Right. Yeah, uh, bottom line is the, 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 the coverage would apply at the weight that they were at when they arrived in the feed yard. Mm -hmm. When they got to that final destination, were they closer to the six weights or were they closer to the 750 to eight? Uh, there is a little bit of variance in that, but uh, it's probably best to just kind of look at that fairly concretely mm -hmm. and say, when, when, when I choose my type, it's gonna be based on how heavy they are when they hit the When they hit the yard. Yeah. So the producer makes that decision as to going left or right according to what his calf weights may be as Correct. to what coverage best fits him. Correct. Right, and then the third, the third is one we've talked about a little bit, is the pooled and non-pooled coverage. Uh, this creates a tremendous amount of, of flexibility. It also creates a tremendous amount of variability in pricing. So the flexibility that it creates needs to be weighed against the variability of cost. Uh, and so we've got some tools to kind of help us sort through that and find out what the best fit is for producers in that area. Uh, but, but that you have to either be pooled or non-pooled isn't an option. The way you set your coverage up will be pooled or it will be non-pooled. Uh, once again, another decision for the producer sure. to make is what best fits their program and maybe what best fits their risk appetite a little, right. depending on how they're foreseeing that. Right, right. And some of the other data that we kind of look over may help in that decision. Okay. For example, you may want to uh, run pooled or non-pooled, but then you may want to use some seasonal trends in how you set the coverage up. So there's lots of things to consider. Uh, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a combine. You know, you look at a combine the first time, you think I'll never understand how this thing works because there's so many moving parts. But basically, a combine is not that complicated if you break it down. LGM is not that complicated, but there are a lot of moving parts. You know, and our goal is to try to help identify those moving parts, explain how they work, the pros and cons, and then you can make your decisions as we go through. To take the time to work with a producer to make sure that they can make that program match to their goals, their needs. Exactly, exactly. And then the final of the four pillars, the unchangeable things, is that you will have to choose a deductible, and that deductible will have an attached subsidy level. Uh, you can choose to have zero deductible, which will have attached to it an 18% subsidy, you can go as high as $150 per head deductible, which I'm not going to say there's not places where that would apply, but generally what we find is that the, the advantage of taking on more risk yourself mm -hmm. goes away when you stop getting additional subsidies in exchange for that added risk. So since the subsidy reaches a 50% level at a $70 per head deductible, it's just going to be very rare that someone would, check, would, would look at more than a Seventy dollar deductible, and we'll we'll uh, we'll also take a. You can look back at that chart. We'll look at it again a little later, and and kind of drive that point home. That's interesting to to break it down like that as a return on investment, and 
once again, to reinforce the fact that uh, producers, depending upon their risk appetite, can select what coverage is best for them. Right, right. And as we get into the specific applications, uh, I think that, that the importance of that becomes a little more magnified. And, and so I, that's, that's a good point and one that we'll follow up on kind of in the second and third sessions. So, uh, so now to take those four pillars and put a little bit of flesh to those, uh, the, 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 the expected gross margin and the actual gross margin are calculated numbers, as we've mentioned. Well, the, the obvious question to producers at that point would be, well, how are they calculated? You know, and so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go into that real briefly, and we're going to start with the yearling fed type. Uh, and, and as we mentioned, the values are different on the calf fed versus yearling. Right. But we'll start one of those choices that the producer right. has to make as to what how that coverage is going to best suit their program. Right. So so on a given day when those sales uh, those uh, sales periods open, uh, if you choose to buy coverage, the calculation for a yearling is going to made as, be made as follows. Uh, it's going to basically use calculations to determine uh, the feeder calf cost that will be used in the calculation, the corn cost that will be used in the calculation, okay. and the fed steer cost that will be used in the calculation on that day looking forward. Okay, and the way that happens is everything is, it stems from the target marketing date, the day the calf will come out of the feed yard. Okay, okay? so the feeder calf portion of that equation is determined five months prior to the end of the month when the cattle will come out of the feed yard, so it's five months back and it's a 750 pound weight. So, and it's the previous three trading days. So if we were looking forward to say December today, uh, five months back would be July. And that July number would be the three previous days trade. So on a Thursday, it would be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of July feeder cattle market averaged times a 750 pound steer to okay. get the feeder calf portion of the equation. Yep. Corn is gonna be two months back of the target marketing date, so we'd be backing up to October, okay. taking the previous three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, of the October futures market for corn, average those three days, multiply that times 50 bushels of corn. That would give us our corn portion of the expected gross margin calculation. The third portion of that is the fed cattle portion. Uh, that, that that portion would look at the December fed cattle market, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, get an average there, take that times 1,250 pounds, and that becomes your fed cattle portion. And the fed cattle portion less the corn and feeder becomes the expected gross margin that's used in the contract. Now, obviously, anyone who deals with feeders or futures markets uh, very much knows that all of those months don't even have futures contracts. Right. Uh, so the, the LGM has a resolution to that and the way it does it is it uses uh, the simple average of the month before and after in months where there isn't a contract or if there's a three month gap it'll use a weighted average. But you can market cattle and insure cattle on LGM in whichever month you choose which in some ways becomes an advantage and other people would say, you know, sometimes that would be a disadvantage. So, but it, but it is a part of the features of the program. But that's a good point that, to, to know because of missing contracts on times that there's always an option there to make coverage whenever the cattle, or whenever the coverage best fits your program as to when your cattle are ready to go. Correct, correct. Right. So, so that's the expected gross margin side, and then the same calculations are used on the actual gross margin side. Uh, the only difference is that instead of using the previous three trading days as with expected gross margin, on the actual gross margin, it uses the last three trading days of the specific months. So on the actual gross margin side, the feeder, feeder cattle portion would be the closing price on the last three trading days of the month, uh, you know, T minus five. Okay. On the, on the uh, corn, it would be the last three trading days for October corn, you know, my, which would be T minus two, the December two months back. Okay. And then on the fed cattle, it would be the last three trading days of December. You know, all of those averaged and then multiplied by the, the respective weights. 
750 pounds on a feeder, 50 bushels on the corn, and 1,250 pounds on the fed. And that, that formula is those, the use of those averages, that formula is the same for everybody. The only time it's different is whether or not you're doing a calf fed or a yearling type Correct. animal to make that change. Correct, right? yep. And what you're ensuring is the difference between the, the expected and the actual. So, I, so naturally, when the actual gross margins end up being better than the expected, there's no claim, no loss. You've got you've got a premium, but you but you don't have a loss because it ended up better. Uh, so that's kind of the the mechanics of the calculations. And then, like you mentioned, the CAFED is the exact same process, except the values that we use uh, or the volumes we use on the weights are different. On a CAFED, uh, you are you're ending up with an 1,150 pound steer instead of a 1,250 pound steer. And on the feeder portion, you're T minus eight instead of T minus five. So you're eight months back on the feeder cattle portion. And you're four months back on the corn portion. And the corn portion is uh, 52 bushels. Uh, so that, and the, and the weight on the feeder calf is 550 pounds versus 750 on the yearling. So the math is the same, but the months that are used and the weights that are used are different. But the rest of it follows the exact same pattern. And, and I think it's important to know, because I, I know the first time that I looked at those formulas, you know, my mind starts racing and I think about, well, I've got cattle that come in at a weight bigger than seven and a half or bigger than five and a half, or it takes me more time or less time or more or less the bushels of corn right. and all those scenarios play out. But the concept that's important to understand is there's an estimated starting point and an actual finish point and, and, and regardless of what those numbers are, you can still use those starting end dates to match up your cattle, even if you're killing 1,500 pound animals instead of 12 and a half, or even right. if you're feeding nine weights instead of 750 weights. Um, and, and all you're really doing there is trying to predict, pr protect what the estimated cost going in versus the actual, so that that program can cover that variance in pricing that we all know lives in, in, in the fed cattle market. Right. Yeah, and, and one of the most common uh, concerns with these calculations is that, that uh, you know, most cattle going into the feed yards these days are more than 750 pounds, and they're taking them to more than 1,250 pounds finished weight, which obviously takes more corn. Right. Uh, and so there is a way to, the, the formulas are fixed, but you can vary that up to about 20%. Uh, based on the head count that you insure. Uh, that's something that we would just talk about as we get to that portion in kind of detailing how we would apply it in an individual scenario. Uh, but there is a way to adjust that to a certain degree. So that's one of the earlier flexibilities that we'll talk about, uh, but there is a way to modify that somewhat. Okay. So that, that's that's kind of the, 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 the difference in the values is really the only difference in the calculations. And then if we wanted to put this in kind of a longhand form, uh, I, 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 I'm not gonna say I looked at this and got it just exactly, but I thought, you know, it'd be, it would be beneficial to kind of have a scenario, kind of an example. Right. So if you went back about a year ago and you said, okay, I was gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna purchase some insurance, I'm gonna purchase an LGM policy, uh, and I dated this back, I think it was May 28th of 21, for cattle that are coming out in December, kind of to stick with our example. Yep. Uh, and, I, and I made the decision to purchase the, the livestock gross margin on that May 28th date. Uh, it, when I look at my expected gross margin on, on yearling fed cattle, uh, and I went through the math and kind of got the estimates for the uh, fed cattle, the average of December fed cattle on May the 24th, 25th, and 26th was 132.40 per hundred weight times a 1,250 pound steer. Gave me a 16.65 value coming out of the feed yard. Mm -hmm. So now I, I, I've got that value. And you look down and you say the feeder then would be the average of July f uh, futures on feeder cattle on May 24th, 25th, 26th, or the the, the equivalent of July, if you had to use the weighted or sure. or the simple average, it was uh, 136.40 uh, on a 750 weight, which was $1,023. The corn on 
October, uh, the, the corn average of October on May 24th, 25th, and 26th of 21 was 543 a bushel times 50 bushels of corn, which gave us a $271.50 per head uh, corn input cost. So the expected gross margin would have been the 1655 less the corn plus the feeders which would have had an expected gross margin of $360.50 per head. So that, that, that purchase of that insurance would have been insuring an expected gross margin uh, of three sixty fifty dollars per head. So then we go forward and we look at what those numbers all panned out to be on the actuals. Mm -hmm. So the calculated end of December values, uh, and, and I would put on here, it, it's regardless of when you sell them. So if those cattle were a little slow getting ready and they didn't sell till January, that's fine. Good point. That's fine, but the insurance is gonna settle as if you had sold them in the month you insured them. So that, that, that's another one of those concrete things. The, right. the, the target marketing month cannot change once you take out the once insurance. Once you take the policy, yep. you, the, even though the cattle may die at a different time frame. Yep. That's understandable. Yep. Exactly. So, uh, so what actually happened was, so the actual gross margin of fed cattle uh, on the end date uh, was 139.11 per hundred times a 1,250 weight. So we had an end, ending value of 1738.87. Uh, our feeder calf, the average of the last three trading days of July feeders, or the equivalent, was 162.66 times a seven and a half weight. So you had a 1218.75 per head input cost of the corn. Uh, was 520 a bushel, so you had 260. So the actual gross margin was the 1738.87 minus the combination of the feeder and the corn, uh, which gave us an actual ending gross margin of 260.12. So you had right at $100 a head loss mm -hmm. in that example. Had those numbers been reversed, you'd have had $100 a head gain and no loss. Right. So it's ensuring, again, the difference in the expected and the actual margins. Uh, you, you, you could have that scenario in a variety of coverage methods. Mm -hmm. So what the cost of the premium would have been would depend on how you set up coverage. This could be as cheap as uh, four or five dollars per head, or it can be as high as 50 to 60 dollars a head. And all of the cost to benefit depends on how you want to use it and how you see it applying in your situation. So uh, this can be, be very affordable under certain cir uh, coverage levels and arrangements, uh, but it can also be very costly, but still very effective because you're asking more for, from it in those scenarios. So there's a, there's a wide range of cost and there's a wide range of when it will benefit you and those need to be tailored to fit in place of or in addition to what you're already doing in your risk management strategy. And again, that'll be kind of the topic of the two sessions that follow. More of that flexibility for the producer to decide how that program best fits him. And as you alluded to there, with or without additional hedging that, that they may be doing traditional type, you know, using futures contracts and things, this can be a supplement to it, a piece in its own or an addition to. Right, right. I think as the product was developed, the intention was that it would be a replacement of. Mm -hmm. Uh, the more we look at it, the more scenarios we run, the more data we look at, uh, there obviously will be places that that's true. But I think the greater use is going to be in a, a supplement to uh, existing uh, risk management strategies. I think that's where it's going to find its home in most places. You know, and, and so as, as you've talked about some of those uh, calculations and, and how we get to those premium coverages and, and what that means on the estimated and the actuals, Let's delve a little deeper into the choices that the producer makes. You know, earlier you brought up pooled and non-pooled, and, and I thought that was an interesting scenario to play out is how that could best fit for each individual producer. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Sure. On the non-pooled or the pooled uh, option, what you're doing is you're having gross margin variances that are determined by month. Uh, and those expected target months uh, are going to always come up with their own loss for the cattle that are covered in that month. The decision is, do we want to combine the net result of one month with another month or with nine more months? It's like how pooled do we want this coverage to actually play out and, and what does that look like and how does that change things? This very much could 
could could lay into a producer's own risk appetite. Sure. Is what, you know, that that's really what you sense from that is, you know, if, if you want to put all your eggs in one basket and take the risk and reward of that or spread them out over multiple months to maybe not pay off as well and maybe pay off even better. But, you know, it, it allows that, once again, that producer to make that decision on his own. Sure. And, and of course, premium risk is, risk is one of the considerations. And so you can alter premium by pooling. And so what happens when you pool coverage is, is the claims are based on each month, but the losses in one month could be offset by gains in another month. And so so the, the, there's pros and cons to pooling coverage. The pro is that as you pool coverage, you get lower premiums. The con is that the, the losses in each individual month will offset one another. So if you have one month that gains, mm -hmm. $50,000 in estimated gross margin versus actual. So you've made more money there, so you don't have a loss there, but your next month you lose $50,000, you have a, an actual gross margin that's $50,000 less, you still don't have a claim because they offset one another. That's why the premium's cheaper. Right. There's places where that's a good decision and fits mm -hmm. what a producer wants to happen, and there's other places where it don't. So the pooled and non-pooled is a big decision. Just how pooled do you want to pool one month or two months or three months together or, or 10 months. So that becomes part of the conversation. And the, the way you use the pooling might change from mark one market condition to the next. And so it's a, it's a very reactive mm -hmm. program uh, that can look different on one month's uh, decision making versus another. And so it's a, it's a, it's a real interesting aspect of it. Uh, the, other, the other thing to, to remember is that the loss that is paid when you pool will always be at the end of the covered period. So if you're pooling 10 months together, you're gonna to have one potential you know, date where you would have a loss paid. If you're pooling two months together, then you would have a potential loss settlement every two months. So cash flow becomes another part of the discussion at that point. Once again, how that best suits each, each producer's operation is to when they need that. And, and like you said, because cash flow in agriculture is, is king. Right. So that kind of, puts in perspective how the pooled and non-pooled works. Uh, the, the next piece of that puzzle is the deductibles and the subsidies options. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that would work for producers? Sure, sure, yeah, that kind of as you get to this point, the last real call to make is what, what deductible level am I willing to, uh, to accept in order to receive the subsidy that I would like to have. And that's a cost benefit analysis. And, and again, that could be different in one, con one marketing period versus another. Sure. Uh, so so the, the deductibles range from zero to 150. We've kind of, I think, established that $70 is kind of where the practicality of that ends. Mm -hmm. uh, and the subsidy uh, percentage goes from 18 to 50%. Uh, and that becomes a, a, a very important part of the, of the discussion on an individual basis. Uh, the, the other thing that kind of goes along with those choices, all the choices that we make, uh, you know, is that premium. And the premium on any of these policies, regardless of how the coverage is set up, uh, is deferred to the end of the covered period. So in the event that you don't have a loss, which this is what we're hoping for, is increased markets right. and better, and, <laughs> right. and better uh, gross margins. In the event that you don't have a loss, then that premium is billed out at the end of the last targeting period. So if you've got cattle coverage on uh, one month at a time, then you could theoretically be getting a bill each month. If you've got cattle covered in three-month pools, then you would get a bill at the end of that three-month covered period. Okay. Now, if you have a loss, uh, if there's a gross margin loss and there's a claim that needs to be filed, then part of the claim process, and it's not a long process, but you do have to provide marketing reports with as evidence that you actually had and fed and sold the number of cattle that you insured, okay. uh, and then that premium would be held out of the loss. So if you had a loss that exceeded the premium, they would hold the premium out and you'd get a check for the balance. Uh, if you had a small loss but not enough to pay the entire premium, it would send out a reduced premium invoice showing your initial premium, the amount of premium that was paid by the loss, and then the premium that still remains. And then you'd have you know, a reasonable amount of time after that to make payment. And we threw a lot of information at 
the producer today uh, to introduce them to livestock gross margin to learn more and to get a little more in depth on how that program can work for you individually. Uh, just reach out and contact your team at Ag Defense Risk Management and you'd be glad to sit down and have a conversation and show them how to make that work into each of their own operations.